the recording is in progress. Simplistic words to be sure, but many times we find them hard to execute. So guide us and inspire each of us to do a little better each day and every day. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. I am pleased to have the honor to introduce our guests for our meeting today. When I call your name, please stand, and if you are able, and remain standing until President Courtney has welcomed you. Ken Locks, guest of Gina Spangler. Ryan Barnes, guest of President Courtney Piccolo. Sioni Cross Maddox, student education, guest of student education. And Yolanda Jones, guest of student education. John Miller and Christian Miller, guests of past president Rob Bowen. Aziza Klein, guest of Al Blakey, and Jean Klein, guest of Al Blakey, Linda Elliker, guest of past president Lou Elliker, Josh Brashiers, guest of Thomas Catalagrone, <laughs> I'm going to get it one of these times, Tom, I promise, I'm going to get it, uh, Ruth Fay, guest of Fred Fay, Bambi, Testafasa, guest of Fred Fay, Kendall Menzer, Menzer, guest of Eric Menzer, and my man Will Anderson, guest of Jim Anderson III. Yes, I'm so glad that someone took the time to invite you to our program today. If this is your first time visiting with us, I hope you find the food, fellowship, and program to be nothing less than outstanding. This is the second time that you have visited our club. Let me be the first to say, welcome back. This is the third time that you've been here. Please come see me after the meeting regarding membership, and we'll get you set up. So Rotarians, please help me welcome our guests. Moving to announcements. I am very sad to report the passing yesterday of one of our club members, Rodney Sechrist. Rodney was a member of our club for 41 years and a faithful meeting attendee. Rodney was very special to me personally because he started the company that I now own, Bailey Coach, with my father 26 years ago. And I'll never forget um, when I was 16 and I had my driving permit, Rodney graciously offered to teach me to drive on the highway. What he did not tell me is that my first trip driving on the highway would be going to Ohio and back. So to say Rodney had patience was an, under, um, an understatement. Our condolences go out to Rodney's wife, Stephanie, and we will share details about funeral arrangements once they have been confirmed. I now ask for a moment of silence in memory of Rodney. For those of you who knew Rodney well, you would know that he would not be very happy that we just stopped the entire meeting for a moment of silence, being the very selfless person that he would he was. That being said, he would want us to move on and continue as normal, and that's what we're going to do. So our next announcement is that the Youth Exchange Committee will meet at 1.30 p.m. today. After this meeting, we're going to be downstairs in the mixed grill. The Communications Committee will meet on Tuesday, June 30th at 4.30 p.m. at South County Brewing. And the idea committee will meet on Wednesday, July 31st at 10.30 a.m. here at the Country Club. On Tuesday, August 20th, from 5 to 7 p.m., we will hold our annual crab feed at the Etzweiler Bungalow on Lake Clark. This fun member event features all-you-can-eat hard shell crabs, among other yummy things. The cost is $25 to attend and RSVP to Rob Bowen right here in the middle if you would like to attend. And thank you to the Etzweiler family for once again hosting this year. Now, let's talk about getting signed up to be on a committee. Thank you to the many members who have already committed to serve on committees for this Rotary year. You did this by clicking on the link that was either sent out last week in the announcer or this past Monday, you would have received an email from Lynn saying, please click here and sign up for the committees that you want to be involved in. If you received that email and you completed that link, you clicked on it and you submitted it, can you please stand? Okay. All right. So our committees are going to be made up of like 
25 people total. <laughs> Thank you. You may be seated. So the good news is if you check your email right now, you would have just received an email from Lynn with this magical link that allows you to sign up to be on a committee. Why do you have to sign up to be on a committee? We do this every year. Um, it is what connects you in the background of Club Runner, our website software to the committee that you serve on. If you just want to keep continuing to serve on the committee that you're already serving on, that's fine. You just still need to click on that link and you need to um, still sign up for that committee that you would like to be on or multiple committees that you would like to be on. Also at your tables, just in case the email did not come through, we have a foolproof system here. There is a fancy QR code here that you can just take out your phone and turn on the camera and hold it over and it'll open the link for you to click on to be on the committee, but this is something important to do. So if you've already had conversations with somebody saying, oh, I wanna be on your committee, you still have to do this. Again, it's what links everybody behind the scenes to be on the proper committees and so that you're getting the proper notifications regarding meeting minutes and upcoming meetings and other things. So please take the time to do it. You can do it right now while we're talking. Um, it should only take you about two minutes. And now I would like to invite Debbie Ashway, Chair of Student Education, to the podium to do recognition of a student scholar. It is my pleasure on behalf of the Student Education Committee to recognize two non-traditional scholarships. The first award of $3,000 goes to Siani Cross Maddox. She is a sophomore at your college with a major in education and looking forward to teaching. She was a little nervous when she arrived today, but she realized she knew many faces in the room. And she has the best dean at your college, Andrew Barnes, <laughs> who's on our committee. The second award of $3,000 goes to Yolanda Jones. She is currently a senior at Penn State York with a major in social work and psychology and is looking forward to Christian counseling. What our table found out about Yolanda today that we all thought was really cool was that she used to be a travel agent for the federal government and worked for the Secret Service. <laughs> or booked for the Secret Service. Um, so join me with a round of applause for these deserving students, Siani and Yolanda. Ladies, congratulations. This award is a testament to your outstanding achievements and the bright future that lies ahead. Well done. And now I invite Christoph, Chair of Membership Engagement, to the podium. All right, for those of you that have not taken your phones out yet to get the QR code, you can take them out. And those of you that generally hide your phone under the table and secretly text while there's a speaker up here, you can take them out and put them on top of the table for this portion of the meeting today. Um, what we're gonna do is the membership engagement committee, we are still looking for members. We, we're capping our committee at 302 members. So feel free, there's still a tiny bit of room to squeeze you in if you decide you wanna be on that committee. But the first thing we want to do is get a little bit of feedback from our membership. So the first thing that you're going to do, you can start it up. Yep. Uh, you can almost there. Nope, right here. All right, if from your table you can't get that QR code, you can just go into uh, vbox.app and put in that ID number for the survey that we're gonna do here. And those of you on Zoom are welcome to participate. give you all a moment. Just a quick show of hands if you're in and ready to go. It's all the people that are already participating in committees. <laughs> <laughs> Th 
Thank you, Courtney. Courtney's tech support today. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to our first question. So if you could hit play on that first one at the bottom there. There you go. There you go. Would you like there to be more networking activities within our club? And then if you could hit the, uh, on the left-hand side of that toolbar. Nope, okay, yeah. There we go. You know, student of the, you know, getting a scholarship, we expect you to maybe use that, know how to use the phone. <laughs> Oh, that was for Debbie. Uh, Debbie. Okay. We're going to give you about 10 more seconds. If you can hit the clock over there. To the left of the toolbar. Keep going. There we go. And then we're going to move on just to get you ready. Question number two is going to ask you what your preference is for an activity. And... That should be popping up on, hit the play in the middle. There we go. Make your choice there. I see some of you have found your favorite activity on that list and are almost embarrassed to put it in. That's fantastic. And then if you could hit our uh, statistics on that one, let's see where we're at on the left, far left. There we go. And it's a good thing we have lunch here every week. All right, we're gonna give you about 10 more seconds to fill that one in. You can start the clock. There we go. All right, now this one I'm hoping that most newer, if you're within the last year a member of our club, you can answer. But if you've been a member for a long time, I would appreciate your feedback as well. But the question is going to be, uh, where do you rate at this moment our onboarding of new members? Yeah, even if, uh, why not go for it? And if you don't know, you don't know. That's why I put that one there too, so. I think we got a good number of people in this crowd right now that onboarded when there was no such thing as onboarding. So I think we're... And let's see our results so far. All right, 10 seconds. Your next question is that's going to come up is, what is your interest in being a part of onboarding new members? And just so you know, this is anonymous, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd track your ass down when I found out that you were interested. Or if you said you're not very interested, I may show up at your house as well. So. Eighty-two percent average is what that's going to. There we go. That's what I was expecting. And we can clock that one down. All right, this one I'm going to be asking a lot out of all of you for. The next question that we have is, what type of activities would you like to see the club offer? And you're going to have to actually type in a word with this one. This is not just click and say average. I need words from you for this one. So, and you can put in a word, enter, you can hit, you can do multiple words, but just enter each time you go through. Like hiking, put in hiking. I'd like to see hiking as something. I would like to see biking. 
apparently from what I saw there, I'd like to see like drinking and eating like, or things along those lines, whatever might be of interest to you. Some people may be more interested in family events. Some people might be uh, more interested. I know it came up once at one of our meetings. Some people might be more interested in singles events, uh, things along those lines. And if you could show our results, let's see what's coming up so far. Ah, there we go. A lot of family events. Happy hours, biking, kayaking. All right, we'll give about 10 more seconds on that one. All right, once again, I'm gonna ask you to think and type at the same time. Uh, what prevents you from attending club networking service or social events? We can see the results there. All right, 10 seconds. There are only two questions left. The next one is, what would get you to participate in more club activities? Again, there's a word one, sorry. I saved the hard ones for the end. If we could start showing results on that one. And that is the top answer so far. That's remarkable. Wine's not too distant second place on that one right now. And oddly enough, family friendly is sandwiched in between the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, going to give you 10 seconds on that one. And I'm thrilled to death with the answers that we just got on that one, because my, my next question to you is, this is going to be a yes or no one. Uh, do you want to join a committee that has a ton of fun, engages our membership, and has food and drinks at each of their meetings? Uh, so... You can answer, yes, I would love to be part of that amazing group. Nah, making our club better is not really my thing. Or only if Bill Hunter is a commu committee member. And by the way, Bill happens to be a member of the engagement committee, the member engagement committee. So for those of you that have not put down your new committee commitments for this year, please take this committee uh, into consideration for it. These questions I asked today are the beginning of what we're putting together as a member engagement survey that's going to go all, out to all of you in the next probably month or so uh, to get a little bit more detailed information so we can build things going on. And to also let you know that committee is going to be part, taking part in running our mentor program. So if you decide that you'd like to be a mentor to a new member, that would be fantastic. We've got about 20 mentors already. We can use as many as possible. Um, and we're going to be scheduling events and ways to get our membership more engaged in things like community service and uh, social networking and business events. So if, does anybody have any questions for me? And I'm only answering yes or no questions today. What's that? Oh, can we see? There we go. Excellent. And by the way, our committee has a budget to pick up the tab for the food. And drink. I saw free food on there. So our committee has a budget to pick up the tab for that. It's a dark pool of money that we keep on the side that nobody knows about. So uh, feel free to join us. And even if you just want to visit us once or twice, we would love to have your input. That's all I've got right now. Courtney, back to you.
All right. So an observation, it's amazing how many people forgot to bring their phones as I was walking around to some of the tables today. No, I'm just kidding. But um, also the question that said things that we'd like to see coming to our uh, club, who typed in skydiving? Was it? It's so funny. I love it, Al. Oh my gosh. Okay. Now I thought it was Wilda. Wilda, our next president, she loves the skydives. There's two. Okay. So now I invite Sean to the podium to introduce today's program, Miller Plant Farm. And while Sean is making his way up here, I learned some interesting facts about our club's connection to the Miller Plant Farm. So two former Rotarians, Roger and John Miller, they grew up in the home of Miller Plant Farm, along with Jake Miller II, who was actually born in the house that is on the Miller Plant Farm. So there's your fun fact for the day. Sean, I'll let you take it from here. There, there are a, a lot of Millers in York County. <laughs> and w one thing I've learned uh, working in land preservation for almost 16 years is you would think when you go to visit a farm in the middle of nowhere, no one knows each other. But it's amazing when you meet landowners, they know all their neighbors. And it's similar to a neighborhood. Everybody helps each other, even though they might be a mile away. And I've had the pleasure of being a neighbor of Dave's for a long time and gotten to know him quite a bit over the last few years, helping him preserve some of the land that you can see. I got to get my bearings. If you go out to the porch here and overlook, you're going to see beautiful fields overlooking the patio of the country club. I would say it's a maybe a par four, but probably for some of you, a par 10 to get over there. But uh, it's a beautiful backdrop now preserved thanks to people like Dave Miller. So we owe him a good bit of gratitude in his family for preserving some of that ground. But we worked with him and his neighbors and and the late Jack Shorb and his wife, Kitty. We preserved part of their farm, which Dave and his family farm, and then another property next door that was the Keeney farm, which had quite a story. And some of the people here that were involved in that, that was quite a process. But um, uh, the, the nice thing when you meet with people too, you get to know that like a normal neighborhood, there's also some crazy neighbors too. So it's always good to vet them with people and say, who should I talk to? But more importantly, who should I not talk to? But I will say that uh, Dave is someone you want to talk to. And I noticed that Mr. Feldman didn't include a prayer for rain. Uh, last year, you know, we were all worried about the York Water Company and their reservoirs. But I saw JT last night and I asked him how the rain's doing. Kind of didn't care because his, his reservoirs are full, but our farmers could use rain. So Tonight, when you're sitting down to dinner, please say a prayer for rain. And with that, I'm going to bring up my friend Dave Miller, and we'll hear a lot about Miller Plant Farm and his family's history in this area. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Um, I would probably rather be on a tractor right now than than here, but uh, we'll see if we can get through this. Um, I'm ready for the next slide. Okay, there's a there's a view opposite of what you would have if you go on the terrace. If you can see at the top of the hill there, that's where we're at right now. That's the country club golf course to the right of that, and. Uh, it's a bird's eye view of Miller plant form from there. First thing I'd like to do is talk about the history a little bit. Um, I don't wanna draw this out too long, but uh, my great grandfather Howard bought the farm on April 1st, 2000, or, uh, 1911. So we've been there over a hundred years. Um, my grandfather, Jacob and Ada, they really got the farm going. Uh, Jacob built his first greenhouse in 1929. And he grew it, he built it for the sole purpose of going to the field with a transplant rather than all his competition was going to the field with seed. So he gained a lot of time on his competition and uh, soon they all asked him to grow plants and that's how the whole thing got started. My father, John and Betty, they, uh, it seems like each generation adds something to the business and they really got the business part going and uh, Betty, my mother, she really got the ornamental part going. So I'm the fourth generation. My son, um, Dustin, is the fifth, and my nephew, Steve. Um, here's, there, there's a, here's a picture of us getting the, the, um, the award for a 100-year farm. Uh, that's Steve on the right. Next to him is Dustin and George Gregg, who was the uh, 
Department of Agriculture secretary at the time, my mother, Betty, me and my wife, Diane. Um, vegetable transplants are still a very big part of our business. Uh, we have production houses of 62,000 square feet of heated growing space, and more than half of our space goes to growing those transplants. We serve customers all over Pennsylvania and uh, few surrounding states. My biggest customer is in West Virginia, and he takes all his produce to Washington, D.C. He claims some of it gets to the White House, but we don't have that verified. So at any rate, uh, next picture. There's a picture of vegetable transplants. That's Greg, one of our longtime employees. And there's the garden center um, that we just built and um, we opened on April 1st, 2011. Uh, we planned that for 27 months and built it in 122 days. I told him if it wasn't open for spring, we can't do it. We got to be open for spring. So uh, it's, it's very uh, accommodating for groups. It's uh, handicap accessible and uh, air conditioned in the, in the uh, retail market part. Uh, it created a space that was very good for events. Um, seasonal events, go ahead. And um, a lot of education, a lot of seminars and that kind of thing that we can now hold there. This is a picture of our summer bash, which by the way is next Saturday, August 3rd. We have a 5K that we do and uh, everything, all ev all the money that we take in from that and other donations uh, is given to WellSpan Cancer Patient Help Fund. That was something that my wife got involved with and uh, we're honoring her wishes. Um, go ahead. This is another shot of the 5K getting ready to start. One of our big things is education. Uh, we are very interested in educating the public. Uh, you know, today's generation has very little idea about growing plants and where their food comes from. You know, there was a time a few generations back where everybody had a tie to a farm, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, something, but that isn't true anymore. They just go to the grocery store and there it is. So they really don't know what it takes to produce food. Um, we do production tours in March and April. There's my nephew, Steve, giving his little part of talk. He, he grows a lot of our seedlings. Um, Go ahead. There's Steve again. Another one. There's Dustin. Now, my son, Dustin, he's in charge of all the ornamentals. Uh, he grows all the, the flowers and, and, and those types of things. So he has his part. Um, the next thing is we're still very much into farming, um, especially vegetable growing. We grow about 50 acres of vegetables at Miller Plant Farm. About 25 of those is sweet corn. Um, and we have some real challenges. One of our biggest challenges is labor. I mean, anyone who's worth their salt is employed all year round, where our business is so seasonal that uh, we had to go to the H2A government program guest workers from, from Mexico. Uh, there, there's our four guys. This is their sixth year there. They're like family. We, uh, we trust them. We treat them. We treat them well, and they treat us well. So uh, that, that's been a program that's really, when it comes to vegetables, saved our farm. Um, there are other challenges this year, particularly the drought. And believe it or not, one of our biggest challenges every year is wildlife. Uh, we have deer issues like um, deer and groundhogs and everything else. I mean, we got to deal with that. Um, my passion is growing crops. I love the farm. My passion is is helping to feed my neighbors. And through that, here's another shot. They're picking sweet corn. There's tomatoes growing. These are onions right after they're planted. And there's that's that's the goal there. Now, this was before the H2A program. Uh, we had a lot of school help. But you know what happens nowadays? Middle of August, the kids go back to school or they have football or they have band. They just weren't uh, really reliable. We really, really need them in September. That's a big month for us. Um, go ahead. So out of feeding our neighbors, we have a CSA program. And uh, that's a program where you pay me in the winter for 21 weeks worth of vegetables in the summer. Uh, so it's uh, it's worked out very well. We have about, uh, it varies between five and 600 members in that. 
Okay, this is a picture of the Keeney Farm. Um, in 2021, the Keeney Farm came up for sale. It lies between Perrydale and the Snyder Farm, which we already own, the Snyder Farm. Um, it was a little more acreage than any one of us wanted to take on, so the neighbors got together. Uh, Kielmar, there on, um, where Kenmar Farm used to be, and Perrydale and Miller Plant Farm went together and bought this farm. Um, and then this farm was already preserved through the Farm and Natural Lands Trust uh, for two reasons, for tax purposes. You can go to the next picture. For Paul Keeney there, for him, uh, it was for tax purposes and, and also to honor his wishes. He wanted that farm to stay in farming. And this was one way to do it. So uh, we all went together and did that. Then Miller Plant Farm, we preserved the adjoining Snyder Farm just uh, this past year, 2024. And um, I will say, you know, that Farm and Natural Lands Trust was a great organiza organization to work with. We had a lot of questions. We had a lot of discussions to make sure that it was a right fit for us. Uh, but through that effort, we now have 200 contiguous acres preserved in York Township for generations to, to enjoy in the future. Um, so with that, I'll take questions. You can go to the, there you go, questions. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Hi, Jean. Hi. Can you elaborate on what the CSA program is? Because I thought that was really interesting when you shared it with me. Okay. Yeah. The, the CSA program, the, the letters stand for Community Supported Agriculture. And what that means is a family can pay me in December, January, February, whenever, and we supply them with 20 or 21 weeks of vegetables in the summer. Um, now, there are things that I don't grow that I source from other local farms um, and put in there so a CSA member has great variety. Um, you know, when the season starts, it's a little hard to get, to get the... Uh, the amount of stuff in that you need, but uh, we source from other from other farms and and can usually get it get it done. I mean, I I could fill it, but I don't know how many people want that amount of squash every year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> could you tell us? Um, I'm back here. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit more about the government program, the H2A program? And also, um, I'm just a suggestion. It would be great to do a rotary event at the farm. <laughs> um, yeah, the H2A program is a program that's that's government run. Uh, you have to jump through a lot of hoops, especially to get it started the first year. Um, the H2A program, you, I mean, it costs a lot of money to get them here. You, I'm responsible for all their travel expenses. And then the government tells you what you have to pay them. And you have to supply housing. The only thing I that I don't supply is the food they eat. And if they didn't have a kitchen they could use, I would have to supply that also. But uh, it's it's a it's a great program. It's a legal way for them to come here and and uh, support their families. They send most of their money back to Mexico, and uh, you know they're they're great guys. We just you know we got four good ones, and I ask them every year. I say, you want to come back next year, and they say the next ten years. So they usually come in March or, or you know, late February, March and stay till mid-October, the end of October. So they're here eight months. So we are asking them to leave their families. Thanks for a great presentation. So each of the generations has added to the farm. What's Justin, Dustin want to do? What's his kind of plans for the farm? <laughs> well, Dustin was very involved in the garden center. So I'm, I'm going to let him off the hook and say that was his addition. Uh, you know, that was something that probably wouldn't have happened if Dustin didn't come back to the farm and decide that's what he wanted to do. I mean, we talked about it for years, but we just didn't have the right horses in place to pull it off and do it right. When he decided after he graduated from Penn State in agribusiness to come back to the farm and he worked a year or so and and liked it, then we decided, OK, it's time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. 
I just wanted to say that my husband uses your plants for our garden and it's one of the only places where we can get purple Cherokee. So thank <laughs> you for that heirloom. Um, and he makes stretch mozzarella with your tomatoes and they are just the most incredible. So I just wanted to say thank you for your plants and your farm. Thank you. Thank you. A number of years ago, we had a speaker here at Rotary uh, who was, like yourself, um, a full-time farmer. And one of the things that resonated with me from his presentation was the difficulty that he and he felt other farmers were having in the dynamic and continually changing targets established by DEP and the environmental and governmental agencies. And that's got to be 10 years ago that, that he was here, at least. Has that gotten any better? Has it gotten any worse? Um, where are you vis-a-vis -vis having to, to comply and work with the governmental uh, regulations and restrictions? Yeah, there are lots of them. I'd say it's, it's better, but only because we've gotten used to it. Uh, it really isn't. I mean, the things are still in place. You still have to have a, a conservation plan and all those things and keep keep tons of records, more records than I ever thought I'd have to keep, but it's not all bad. Uh, you know, we we learn something about ourselves when we keep records as far as the the way the farm operates and how things work. But it, yeah, it is, it is a lot of regulation, especially in the vegetable end. I mean, with inspections, uh, you know, our, our packing house and things gets inspected and, you know, you just have to, and, you know, we, we do those things anyhow. We've operated without inspections for how many years? And as far as I know, it hasn't been an issue. Anyone ever got sick or anything, but this is one thing that, uh, you know, that, that makes sense. So uh, first I want to vouch for Miller's CSA program. Our family has benefited from that for years. I highly recommend that. I also want to expand on Kelly's question a little bit. She was asking about what Justin's contribution is. And you said that was the garden center, but with a hundred year legacy in the family and the farm, what do you see the future of the farm being in the next 20 to 30, maybe even 50 years? Well, that's, that's a question mark. Uh, yeah. I, we don't know. Um, we do have some, I have some grandchildren that are, you know, very interested at this age, but that can all change. Um, but we have an employee or two that's been with us forever that I, I do see them somehow having part ownership in, at some point uh, to keep it, to keep it going, pass it on. Um, but it's, that's a challenge. It really is. Yes. Uh, we've heard a lot lately about the, the Chesapeake Bay and the initiatives to keep the, uh, uh, the bay clean. Uh, has uh, that impacted, have those initiatives uh, uh, impacted your farming techniques or, or fertilizing or any of those types of things? Yeah, the, the, the two things that's impacted us with is you must have a conservation plan and we have a few cattle. You have to have a manure management plan. Um, other than that, we aren't under the same regulations that Maryland is. Maryland has really, I hate to say it, but going off the deep end a little bit, they tell their farmers what they can fertilize with and how much, and th their farmers have to take soil tests, and which we do anyhow, but I mean, they, they're, they're, they have to take soil tests and tissue tests so they know what they're allowed to do. Uh, we haven't gone that far yet, but uh, hopefully we don't. Uh, it's just more stuff, you know. <laughs> hey, Dave. Uh, yeah. I, for one, will eat squash all summer long from you guys. So keep keep making it. Um, I'm curious what you think about there. I've seen a huge influx of Amish farms uh, or Amish families coming over and buying farms, paying a premium. We always hear that, uh, you know, farming doesn't stay in the family. Obviously, it has in your family. Sometimes they're sold for development and sometimes they're being bought and a lot more being bought and outpriced uh, by the Amish. I'm curious as to your thoughts. I'm not sure if you work with them in getting some of your bills for the CSA in the store or anything like that. Yeah, we, we do deal with with Amish uh, in a couple of different ways. We supply a lot of transplants to Amish farmers, a lot of vegetable transplants, probably have 40 Amish farms that we go to with deliveries. Um 
as far as the Amish movement in New York, I just talked to, uh, I get my, my uh, free range eggs from an Amish farm on LaRue Road in Sem Valleys. And uh, he claims that there's 60 families now in that part of York, Seven Valleys, that uh, and west, almost to Adams County. That doesn't include the ones in Delta, down in that area. And there's far more than that down there. Um, I mean, one thing good about the Amish when they buy a farm, you know, it's not going to grow houses. Um, I mean, that's I've often heard it said the last crop a farmer grows is houses. You know, and there's some truth to that. Uh, when they when there's no one to pass the farm to, they sell it. Most times it goes to uh, development, but hopefully the Amish, uh, you know, when the Amish buy a farm, they don't, they look at it as a generational investment. It's not just, I'm not, because they're never going to make money on that farm in their lifetime, the price of land. Can you share with us how technology in farm equipment has changed over the years? Yeah, it, it really, it really has been a big deal, especially, especially in the greenhouse, uh, we now have two vacuum seeders that we use um, all the time, and they're uh, pretty amazing pieces of equipment. Um, the greenhouse has a lot more technology. Now, if you're if you're farming in a big way, which we aren't as far as soybeans and corn and that kind of thing, all these new tractors have GPSs on them and auto steer and everything else. So when you see those really straight rows, don't give all the credit to the farmer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dave, it was inspiring to hear about your family's journey and achievements and connection to our community. So thank you for being here with us today. Rotarians, another round of applause. As you all know, instead of giving the speaker a gift, we purchase a book and we ask them to sign the book plate and we donate it locally. This week's book will be donated to YMCA of the Roses, along with the bookmark made by the students at Creative York. Next week, we will hear about history made here in York County. Join us as we will celebrate York County's birthday, America's birthday, and the anniversary of our nation's first constitution. So here's the background. In August of 1749, the county of York was created as the fifth county of Pennsylvania. And then in July of 1776, the Second Continental Congress signed and adopted the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia. Then in November of 1777, the Second Continental Congress met at the courthouse in the Square of York, and they adopted the Articles of Confederation, our nation's first constitution, which formally ratified that the original 13 colonies were now the United States of America. Our program will be presented by Commissioner and Rotarian Julie Wheeler, as well as Register of Wills and Press President Ro Rotarian Brian Tate. And they will share how York County will be celebrating and kicking off with York County's birthday next month in August. This meeting is now adjourned.